Hello, thank you all for joining. Um, I'm Vivian Anugam, Health Equity Program Manager for Alina Health System. Um, and I am really excited to um, speak with you all today. And I look forward to hearing your comments and questions um, at the end of the presentation. So what we'll do today um, is uh, really, um, I'll help you understand what Alina Health is doing um, around um, eliminating health disparities. Um, also share an example of how analytics um, has helped us support um, eliminating health disparities in our system um, and share some of the results to date. So learning objectives for today. Um, well, you know, like I said, understand how we're identifying disparities. Um, and well, I really, really, really want to be able to hear what um, some of the things that are top of mind for you all. Um, and then we'll talk about how bias can impact health disparities. So first, let's start with a poll question. I'm really curious to know uh, where everyone's uh, joining from. Uh, what setting do you work in? All right, I'm gonna so go ahead and turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks Vivian, we'll launch this poll. So if everyone can just answer this really quickly, what setting do you work in? We have options, provider organization, payer, government, vendor, or other. We'll give you a few seconds to answer that. Looks like we've got votes coming in. And we will go ahead and close that poll and share the results. So it looks like we kind of have a mix, you know, a good percentage are from provider organizations. So um, okay. lots of people in the other category, um, some okay. government. Um, so that hopefully gives you a little sense of our audience, Vivian, today. Yeah. Oh, it's it's really helpful to hear that, um, especially hearing that lots of folks are from provide organizations. So hopefully the information I shared today will be helpful. Um, and also, if you're um, interested, you could also, it, for those of you that said other, um, just try to type in the chat box where you're coming from. Just And I'd love to review that afterwards. So thank you. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about Alina Health first. Um, so Alina Health is a not-for-profit healthcare system um, that cares for patients from beginning um, of life uh, to end of life uh, through our 90 plus clinics, uh, 12 hospitals, and various specialty care services. Uh, our mission um, is to serve our community through seamless connections um, and fluid care. So, you know, we have so many opportunities to connect with our patients. Um, and we want to ensure that anyone who seeks care at Alina Health uh, receives quality care that's tailored to their unique needs. So anytime I'm talking about this topic or talking about health equity, I love to use this graphic. Hopefully most of you have seen this before. Um, but I, what I would like to do is just sort of talk about, you know, what is health equity and use this graphic to sort of illustrate what equity is versus equality. Um, and use a, I guess, re relevant example um, to help us understand the difference. So, you know, when we, um, I think as healthcare providers or in healthcare, we strive to provide quality care to everyone. Um, and, you know, when we look at equality, so let's say, okay, right now we're dealing with COVID, right? And say, you know, we wanna stand up a uh, COVID testing, uh, curbside testing site. Um, I know we're talking about vaccines now, but let's stick with testing for now. And um, you know, you you recognize that around the neighborhood, um, you know, you want everyone to be able to get to the testing site, but transportation may be an issue or an, a barrier for folks. And so you want to say, hey, we want our community to be able to get to our testing site. Let's provide transportation and let's provide bikes to everyone that so that they can get to the testing site. And so you give everyone the same bike, that's equality. As you can see, giving everyone the same bike does not necessarily work for everyone's needs and abilities. Um, equity is saying, hey, we recognize that transportation is a barrier and we're going to do the best that we can to provide the service, with the, in this case, the bike that means the individual's needs. And so from an equity perspective, you know, uh, well, before we can re really uh, um, achieve equality for all, we need to make sure that we are able to adapt the way that we provide care so that um, the folks who are sort of starting um, at a deficit um, have 
uh, the ability to sort of step up um, to get to the point where they can um, achieve uh, similar outcomes as um, others. So let's go to the next slide. Um, also want to just read the definition of health equity. Um, so at Alina right now, we've adopted the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation de definition of health equity. Um, and it reads, health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. Uh, this requires removing obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerlessness and lack of access to good jobs with fair pay quality education and housing, safe environments and healthcare. Um, and, you know, I want to point out that, you know, although healthcare is called out, um, healthcare is not the only factor um, in, in achieving health equity. And so it is crucial for all of us in different sectors and different parts of our communities to come together and, um, and, and do our part uh, to, support our communities in achieving health equity. And um, I'll read the definition for health disparities. So health disparities are differences in the incidence, prevalence, mortality, and burden of diseases and other adverse health conditions that exist among specific population groups in the United States. Um, so for us at Alina as a healthcare system, you know, we are looking at the health disparities within our quality outcomes. Um, but also looking at um, access to our, our facilities as well. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of us have probably heard that COVID-19 um, is disproportionately affecting our communities of color. Um, this pandemic has really magnified the disparities um, that, we, that we need to address immediately, um, but also as we sort of plan for the immediate um, uh, solutions, uh, we have to also be ensuring that whatever solutions we're putting into place now are sustainable and will address the structural racism and health-related social needs that are among um, the root causes of these disparities. So let's take it back to Alina. So, uh, as I mentioned, we've, you know, we're trying to address the health disparities at Alina. Um, you know, as you can imagine, we're because we're such a large healthcare system, there are lots of opportunities. Um, but there are a few things that um, need to be done or ways that you need to think that you need to uh, address or focus on before to ensure that whatever, um, whatever uh, solutions that you develop are sustainable. So for us, we've tied our health equity work to key strategic initiatives within our system. We have an executive uh, sponsor of the work. Um, in this case, or in this, this year, it's actually our uh, CEO, Penny Wheeler. Um, and really, to be honest, you know, for us to be able to really address, uh, create lasting solutions to addressing disparities, we have to have executive leadership support um, and buy-in. Um, and then uh, as you sort of uncover the dis different disparities and, and, and opportunities, um, there are ways to uh, also prioritize what those disparities are. And I'll cover that a little bit um, later. And then uh, creating an infrastructure uh, to support uh, uh, and support implementation um, is crucial um, because like I said, there's lots of this, there are probably lots of um, opportunities for us. There are lots of opportunities and we need to ensure that whatever solutions we create are sustainable. All right, so let me give you, so some of you probably have heard me speak um, at the Haas um, conference earlier this year. And um, since then, we've actually made quite a bit of, um, have, have had quite a bit of movement in terms of how we have looked at um, sort of uh, looking at how we, we support our communities. Um, and we have made some, uh, some serious strides in really identifying who community is for us um, and uh, wanting to just share what our definition of community is. So for us, community is patients, employees, and people who live in the communities we serve. Um, who are of all races, ethnicities, gender identities, sexualities, abilities, and economic means. So trying to be as inclusive as possible. Um, 
And for us, we are committed to improving the health of all people in our communities um, by leveraging the collective strength of Alina Health as a care provider, employer, purchaser, and community partner to eliminate systemic inequities and racism. So we're really calling out um, racism um, as, as a key uh, root cause for, for the inequities we're seeing. Uh, here I'll show you sort of the, the commitment that we've made um, for to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and some of the specific goals that we've set forth. So as the healthcare provider, and this is sort of where health equity work lives, um, we are committed to improving access to experience with health, with care, um, making invest investments that create innovative solutions, um, and building uh, care models that support our patients' needs, and eliminating disparities. And for us, you know, we've really worked to identify what are the goals um, that we are working towards under each um, each uh, role that we have as a healthcare system. So our role as a healthcare provider, our role as an employer, our role as a purchaser of goods and services, and our uh, role as a community leader and partner. And so for us, this is our roadmap um, going forward to say, you know, as we are commit, we've made this commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. What is it that we're going to do, and how? Um, what what do we want our community to hold us accountable for? So pulling it back to health equity and our role as a healthcare provider specifically, um, you know, some key opportunities that have been identified um, as we continue on this journey um, to eliminating health disparities, um, we've identified some, some places for us to start as a system. So um, we've seen that. Um, a lot of our leaders uh, have the opportunity to learn more about our uh, ability to pull race at the same language from our dashboards um, to help them identify disparities in their uh, quality outcomes and access. And then um, also there's an opportunity to develop tools to help leaders actually address the disparities once they've uncovered them. And then um, there's also an opportunity to normalize working with diverse patients and communities to co-create solutions to the, those disparities. Uh, we cannot continue to um, develop solutions within sort of our office space or homes. Um, we have to work with community and co-create with community um, to ensure that what we're doing is the right, right thing. And then, um, increasing visibility of disparities and the work that's being done across uh, the system. So, um, you know, I think for one, you cannot address what you don't know. So once we've uncovered the disparities, we have to keep monitoring um, progress towards closing them, ensuring that our colleagues across our system in our community understand what's being done so that we can learn together. Um, current states, we have uh, one health equity goal um, that we are tracking at our at the system level, and we will be expanding that in 2021. So today I'll be talking about um, the one goal that we have on our scorecards. Uh, let me also just talk a little bit about um, the strategy and and the way that we're sort of um, uh, working towards uh, achieving equitable care. So, or providing equitable care. So uh, from a capacity and cap capability building piece. So as I mentioned, you know, there's lots of opportunities to get our leaders and our, um, my colleagues sort of up to speed on first, how do we identify the disparities but, and then um, how to actually address them. So we'll be developing a health equity toolkit um, that will sort of help bring uh, my colleagues across or through the process of identifying disparities, addressing them, um, and then also just understanding the root cause as well um, in that. So, you know, um, looking at the literature, uh, talking to stakeholders, which are frontline staff and community members um, and patients. Um, so developing a health equity toolkit that will assist teams in actually doing that work. And then uh, we've developed something called culturally responsive care training. And it's really geared towards helping our uh, frontline staff, our providers understand how um, culture influences health, uh, how uh, it influences how people show up to the healthcare system, touches on cross-cultural communication, 
um, and also just you know gives um, uh, intro into bias as well. Um, and then we will uh, also be embarking on a, a race, ethnicity, and language, and SOGI, which is sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, data quality project, just really un to ensure that our staff who are actually collecting the data um, understand why it's important and feel comfortable in actually articulating that importance um, to patients. Uh, so that folks understand that we need this data to be as accurate as possible so that um, because it, it will be informing um, any improvement projects that will um, that are identified. And then uh, from a value and accountability perspective. So, um, you know, firstly, we need as we continue to identify this and address them, we want to ensure that our solutions are sustainable. Um, and so one example of that is we, um, as a system, have uh, formed a partnership with Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is pretty unique. Um, and within that work, we are identifying some health equity metrics um, and exploring um, how we can uh, come together as a provider and a payer to understand what it really takes um, to um, create sustainable solutions. And then, um, you know, as we have identified our health equity goals for the following, the next year, um, we are integrating those goals into various scorecards. So, for example, our primary care um, group has identified uh, colorectal cancer screening disparities um, for our African American patient population as a focus area. And so, you know, that uh, the goal that they've set will live on their scorecard. And they will be um, they will be held accountable to sort of continue to monitor progress towards goals those that goal um, as they um, implement their their strategy. And then at, at the system level, we have um, several diversity, equity, and inclusion goals that um, will be uh, monitored at the executive level. And then um, going up to the orange bubble, um, really just again, how do we um, address disparity? differently. So, you know, as we are building um, our capacity and capability, um, we are also learning how internally, we're also learning how to um, work with diverse patients and community members uh, to create solutions. Um, so work in 2021 um, will be focused on, on really um, creating a process to help our teams um, do that. So how do we integrate um, or how do we incorporate um, community voices into our uh, improvement projects. And then um, engaging departments in identifying um, the disparities. That's, you know, that's part of the, the work that we'll be doing. And then from a communication and transparency perspective, um, as I mentioned, it's important for us to uh, share what's being done internally. But I think also uh, from a transparency perspective, there's opportunity to share our opportunities. Um, so the disparities and progress towards closing those gaps with community. Um, so we have sort of another level of accountability. All right. So for us, um, just, to, just to talk a little bit more about how we use data to identify inequities. So uh, right now, um, it is standard practice for us to include the race, ethnicity, and language filter on our dashboards. Um, like I said earlier, there is opportunity to increase awareness of that filter, but we do um, include it on our dashboards. Um, and you know, the, uh, the filter really helps us to uncover the unique experiences of historically underserved populations and, and the opportunities to reduce those health inequities. Um, all, you know, although the, the real filter is helpful um, in, uh, uh, for uncovering some of these opportunities, it's not um, complete. And so, you know, it is crucial to still be able to understand um, how other factors influence health. So, you know, how, what are the patient values and beliefs um, that our, our patients and community members have around healthcare? Um, what are some of the, what are some specific healthcare interventions that exist? Um, are they working, are they not? Um, and then talking about the social determinants of health, um, is housing instability a factor for a patient? Uh, financial resource strain, culture, 
um, gendered identity, food insecurity. So, you know, on, it, it is, although it is helpful to really understand and where disparities exist by race, ethnicity, and language, and also sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, you know, there it does not um, replace the need to talk to people and really understand um, from the patient and the community perspective what else um, could what is contributing to those those disparities. Um, so I, you know, I've kind of talked spoke spoken to this, but this is just a really high level uh, flow of how you address disparities. So, you know, first identify the disparities. I think uh, for us, you know, we have the ability to do this um, through the filter, through our community health needs assessments um, and talking to patients and community. Um, but I think there are organizations that are probably in this category where you have to be, you have to build in those systems to be able to understand where your opportunities lie. And then getting into understanding the root causes, um, looking in the literature, talking to community. Um, and then lastly, implementation and securing the resources that are needed um, to, to actually close those gaps. Um, you know, I, I wanted to actually share this prioritization, prioritization um, graphic here of how to prioritize the different disparities you might uncover. So, um, you know, one thing that, uh, a couple things that you would want to keep in mind is, you know, um, what is your current sphere of influence? What programs do you already have in place? Um, what communities do you serve? What partnerships do you already have um, in place um, and have built trust? Um, and then um, if you've uncovered a disparity using your, in, in your data, is it statistically significant? Is it clinically significant? Um, and then um, could the solutions drive value? But I think for me, the, the most meaningful question to ask is, is there meaningful impact to community? Um, because we wanna make sure that we are working on what matters most to community, our community members. Um, so let's go a little bit into, uh, let me talk through a, a, an example of how we've addressed disparities at Alina. So after looking at data in 2018, uh, one of the disparities we decided to start working on was around hospice care. Uh, we found that minorities were disproportionately um, dying in the hospital setting versus hospice. Uh, disparity in hospice length of stay for minority groups um, were uncovered. And, and we saw that uh, there are fewer minorities in the hospice program overall and lower hospice referral rates amongst minorities. And so although we uncovered all these different um, disparities, we decided on um, focusing on increasing referrals to hospice for our African-American patients. There have been lots of studies exploring hospice uh, utilization of, among African-American patients. Um, and I just want to share a few key findings um, for a qualitative lens into how many, um, but not all, African Americans might approach hospice and end of life care in general. So the research says that African American patients are more likely to prefer aggressive treatment than white patients. Um, African American patients are more likely than white patients to mistrust healthcare providers. Um, and African Americans um, prefer to care for family members. To the end of their lives. So, like I said, you know, this is not everyone's belief, but this is what we see in the research. Um, so, you know, um, our internal data showed us, though, that our African American patients were less likely to receive referrals to hospice. Um, but it was during our conversations with providers about the disparity data um, that we heard about their past experiences with making uh, making referrals to hospice is for eligible African-American patients. Um, and many of them were not surprised by the data. Um, so these, I think these conversations highlighted that uh, bias could play a role in the referrals to hospice. Um, we had one provider um, you know, share, and we appreciate his vulnerability in saying this, but you know, he shared that um, in his past experience, um, his African-American patients have not typically wanted to um, uh, even talk about hospice. And so, um, 
and, and sometimes he's, because of that, he hasn't actually um, felt comfortable making those referrals or even just bringing up the topic. Um, and so we decided to, instead of um, jumping to, you know, after we've uncovered these disparities, instead of jumping to saying, well, we need to educate them and we need to help them um, um, engage in hospice, we decided that it made sense to sort of take, hold a mirror to ourselves and take a step back and say, what is it that we can change and improve on internally um, to get at some of this, some, these disparities? And so what we did, um, it was to develop a implicit bias training specifically around um, hospice. So um, we, you know, in the training, we gave an overview of what hospice is, um, what implicit bias is, talked about the research that um, I shared earlier, um, but really opened it up um, to create a sp safe space for the providers to talk about their experiences and really understand how, um, yes, even though they've had some of these um, um, experiences with African-American patients not um, engaging in hospice care, um, it does not mean that they should not um, still bring up the topic and try to meet the patients where they're at um, and give the patient, our patients, our African-American patients, um, enough information for them to uh, make informed decisions about hospice. And so um, really quickly, I want to just read um, the definition of um, in implicit bias. Um, so also known as unconscious bias, um, implicit bias is the, in, is the bias in judgment and or behavior that results from subtle cognitive processes um, that often operate at a level below conscious awareness and without intentional control. Um, so bias is automatically activated. It's often unintentional. Um, and it's a normal aspect of human, the human condition. Um, I also, I always like to just point out that we all have implicit biases. It's just that um, people of color typically are the ones that are uh, most affected by it, in patient care at least. Um, so how does implicit bias affect the patient experience? Um, providers, um, who have a pro-white implicit bias might dominate the conversations with their patients. Um, they might use slower speech, which can be offensive to folks, um, uh, and be less positive when compared to their interactions with white patients. Uh, patients are, might be less, because of these biases, patients might be less involved in decisions about their care. They may uh, be less satisfied overall, um, and may be less likely to return for follow-up visits, which can have a negative impact on their health outcomes. Uh, so I just wanted to just give a high-level overview of the learning objectives of the hospice implicit bias training that we developed. So um, we wanted to uh, provide a perspective of African-American patients' perceptions of end-of-life care. So we shared the, the data, uh, what we're seeing in the research. Um, explore bias and its effects on communication related to hospice services um, and provide resources for actually how, like how to actually mitigate um, bias, but also how to commit, communicate effectively around um, hospice services and end-of-life care. We also gave them some uh, mitigation strategies, so specifically things like um, recognizing um, situations um, that magnifying stereotyping and bias, um, talked about the teach back method, um, understanding um, how to individuate your patients. So, you know, knowing that, um, knowing what the research says about African Americans and um, hospice, also knowing your, your, their, your experiences, um, and still having that sort of in the, in the background, recognizing that, yes, even though that maybe I've had uh, several patients who have um, turned down hospice, it doesn't mean that um, I cannot treat the current patient in front of me as an individual um, and understand where what their knowledge of hospice is and where they're coming from. So 
So this sort of covers what I just shared. So um, in closing, you know, I know this work is hard. And even as we've sort of uncovered other disparities within our, our system, um, it's actually, it's <laughs> once you have the infrastructure in place to pull the data and understand where the opportunities are, that actually is kind of the easier part of the process. Um, it's the next level of understanding the root cause, being comfortable with holding the mirror up to yourself and saying, you know, as a system, as a program, what is it that we may be doing unintentionally um, to contribute to these disparities? Um, and what are we going to do about it? I think that's the hard part. But I encourage everyone to continue to learn, continue to be open, uh, continue to be comfortable with being uncomfortable in this space, um, and ask questions. So I shared one example of how we've addressed disparities within our system. We have many more opportunities um, to kind of struggle through this, but um, doing something is better than nothing. So even if in 2021, the only thing you do is just even just uncover the disparities and, and, and sort of sit with it and, and increase awareness within your system, um, that's a win. Um, so I, I would just say, uh, have you know, be courageous in this work, um, support each other, ask questions, be okay with being uncomfortable, um, and, and just start somewhere. Oh, actually, let me just show you real quick before we take questions. Um, so this is just a, a current up, update of our, our, where we're at with our office disparity um, goal. Uh, so last year we did train um, I think over a hundred of our providers in this work. Um, it the specific hospice disparity or hospice implicit bias training um, has actually morphed into a larger scale um, uh, implicit bias training initiative. And so internally we are um, we have developed three different bias training modules. So one is uh, just a general foundations of bias training for um, all of our employees. And then another one is a more targeted um, bias training geared towards patient care. So, um, you know, instead of focusing on one program and one um, population, we've expanded it to say, and, and developed it in um, partnership with some of our providers. Um, to be able to just increase awareness in general around how bias can enter the patient care interaction. Um, so we are um, doing pretty, we, we're doing pretty well in October, um, meeting our monthly goal. Um, but, you know, this work is going to take a while to really, really see um, lasting um, impact. Um, but we will continue to monitor our progress. Um, and pivot and implement other um, interventions to get at closing these gaps. So with that, um, I'm going to go, I'll be able to take questions. Um, let me know if there's any piece of the presentation that you'd like clarity on. Um, yeah. Thank you all for your attention. Yeah. Thanks, Vivian, for the great presentation. Um, as she mentioned, if you have questions, now's the time to submit them in the control panel and we'll begin our Q&A session in just a moment. Um, we do have one more poll question for you. Let me go ahead and launch that. Um, while today's uh, presentation was focused on health equity, um, we'd like to know if you'd like to learn anything more about Health Catalyst. Um, so if you'd like to learn more, please answer this poll question and we will leave that open for a few moments as we uh, begin our Q&A session. So Vivian, we've got a lot of great questions coming in. So I'm just gonna start at the top and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, okay, so we had two people ask, um, they just wanted you to clarify what real stands for in your oh, Sorry. Yeah, real is race, ethnicity, and language. Perfect. Okay, next question. Um, Karen asks, does your toolkit include the use of the ACE score and use a trauma-informed approach? Um, so the toolkit is still in development. Um, I don't know what the ACE score is. Um, but yes, there will be elements of a trauma-informed um, care perspective that's critical um, if we want to um, 
care for our, all of our patients in the way that makes sense. Perfect. Okay, next question. Um, this comes from Starlet. Um, how would you suggest incorporating this information in education for future health providers and professionals? Is this something that should be addressed in every course or in a single course, uh, single source on inequities? Um, so I'll answer this two ways. So, so first, I believe that equity should be integrated um, in any way possible. So any course um, um, using examples. But um, so for us, we have a um, internal medicine residency program. Um, and we are actually working on um, developing, so the culturally responsive care training that I mentioned, we're rolling that out to them, rolling um, also the implicit bias training to them. Um, so yes, they are receiving it in residency, but they, I, I think that healthcare providers should be receiving it from the very beginning um, of their um, clinical education, but also even in the um, application process, having folks start to think about how they um, think about their own personal commitment to this um, to work, this work. Um, and then also um, it's one thing to sort of talk, um, integrate the, the training piece, but there's the experiential piece of it. And so um, after the residents have gone through the, the training, we'll also engage them in some of the specific health equity projects. Um, so that they can start to see um, their role in, in uh, closing those disparities and improving the quality outcomes that we um, are focusing on. Hopefully I answered your question. That's great. Uh, next question comes from Rebecca. Uh, when you engage your teams in discussions about implicit bias in hospice care, how did you prepare people to facilitate the conversation? We were wondering if our team leaders are ready to deal with the fragility and denial that will come up. Yeah, so um, we, so it was three of us that actually led the training. Um, so I, I do recognize that it would take a little bit um, of work to get others to be able to lead the training, but um, I think there's opportunity to focus on just normalizing the concept of bias for everyone. Um, and, you know, this, everyone's on, on a different point of, um, in the journey of this this type of work. And so I think engaging the folks that maybe have a higher level of comfort um, and focusing on those folks to kind of say, okay, we recognize that bias plays a role in patient care, for example. How do we get ourselves to the point where we are comfortable um, actually um, having those conversations with our colleagues? So I would start with the folks that have more comfort or in this work um, and don't jump to trying to to change everyone's minds. Um, you're going to have folks that'll feel more comfortable sort of sitting back and, and going along the journey um, at a different pace. Awesome. Okay. Next question comes from Joe. What tools do you use? Do what tools do you use for root cause analysis for impact? Who have you identified as key members to impact implicit bias change? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, for the root cause piece, um, like I said, we're building our health equity toolkit, um, but there are several um, factors to take into consideration. So um, in terms of root cause, so you're, you can look internally at workflows. It kind of depends on what you're looking at, if it's a program or um, a, a quality outcome. But looking at um, looking at workflows, um, so for I'll give you an example for the with the hospice project. So we actually mapped out the process for making hospice referrals um, and looked at from the beginning, you know, when a patient um, enters our system to when they receive the referral and identified very, you know, specific points and where um, some breakdown could happen. And um, so I think, you know, mapping out workflows and identifying key issues or key or potential issues um, is one way. Um, and then 
uh, talking to your, that people that are actually being affected by this. So patients, community, um, I think that helps. That is another way to um, address the root causes. Um, and then in terms of the bias piece, what was the question again? Was it how do you engage? How have you identified key members to impact implicit bias change? Um, I think, like I said, I, for us, it was, <laughs> there were a few of us that were more comfortable with the conversation. So um, I think identifying the folks that are um, more comfortable with having these conversations, um, and it, it sort of depends on how large your institution is. So if you have a diversity and inclusion um, lead within your organization or a health equity lead, I would start with them because they've probably already had folks um, sort of self-select and identify themselves. Um, so for us, right, like we've um, started out a health equity um, committee internally, and it's really made up of a group of folks that have, you know, um, raised their hand and said, we're interested in addressing disparities. We're not really sure how, but we want to do this work. And so I would, I would just, you know, find those folks that that have an interest and a passion um, to to start those conversations. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. Karen asks, did you include assessing the level of shared decision making uh, was used at the different sites? Yeah, no, we didn't get to that point. Okay. Okay, next one that comes from Jacqueline. Do you find that hospice is not explained to patients as a benefit, not a death sentence among African-American patients? Yeah, there's definitely opportunity to improve how we introduce hospice. Um, <laughs> and we did actually address that in the implicit bias training. So um, for us, it's it's not introducing, it's not introducing hospice as something, the last thing we have to offer you because like we're basically we're giving up. It's more, it's it's rather flipping it and saying, hey, we have this hospice program and these are the benefits and we think this is the best care that we can provide to you now. Um, so I think part of it is uh, folks feel, patients feel like um, we're giving up and introducing hospice is not necessarily giving up. Um, it's, it's ensuring that you are, if you are, you know, near the end of life, you are as comfortable as possible and you are, um, your, your needs are being taken care of um, during that, that phase. Great. Okay, next question. Um, Kelsey asks, how did a line of providers get access to the anti-bias training? Um, the implicit bias training. So actually, fortunately for us, the hospitalist lead, so we did, we focused on hospitalists first. Their lead um, was a champion for this work and he offered it um, as uh, some continuing education class for the hospitalist. So I think every year they have to complete a certain number of um, continuing education courses and um, the, the implicit bias training was one of those offerings for folks. To, to choose from. Great, okay. Next is Dorothea asks, have you received pushback from coworkers for this training? Nope, luckily, <laughs> at least not, not to us, us directly. Um, and it's actually really interesting and encouraging at the end of um, each training, we actually um, had an evaluation and asked the providers what, what they thought about the training. And uh, most of them said that they would recommend it to their, their colleagues. Um, most of them said that they prefer for the training to be in person versus some you know online uh, module that they could just click through, which was encouraging. Um, so we have to get creative in, um, during these times. Um, but most of them, um, and then we actually had a lot of folks at the end of this session say, you know, I didn't know I needed this training. Um, and I wasn't really sure what I was coming to, to hear. Um, but, you know, this is the, the training that I didn't know I needed. So 
we actually got really good feedback. And to be honest, you know, if, if providers are saying that your training is valuable, I think it's pretty successful. <laughs> yeah, that, that's really true. <laughs> okay, next one um, comes from Hugh. Hope I'm saying your name right. Um, before you engage in equity work at Alina, did you go through an organizational self-assessment? If yes, what tool did you use? Yeah. Um, so I believe there was a self-assessment um, a few years back before I took this role. Um, but as part of what we were, are internally are calling community recovery, so it's really understanding from a diversity, equity, and inclusion perspective, what is it that we are doing <laughs> to address the, these issues? Um, and we did not use a specific tool per se, um, but what we did was just sort of understand current state, understand our opportunities, um, and build a plan. So I, I, to be honest, I think that there is opportunity to do a health equity specific assessment, um, which I, we plan to do. And IHI has a pretty good tool out there. Um, there's a way to share links, or if you contact me directly, um, IHI has a pretty good tool that um, I uh, would like to adopt. So it really takes you through the different parts of your, um, I think it's geared towards health systems. You could probably adapt it for your, your space, but really just understanding the opportunities from an infrastructure perspective, um, from a education perspective, um, and I think community connection as well. That's great. Okay, next question comes from Catherine. What is your organization doing to improve data collection to be able to better understand other disparities in care that may exist? Yeah, so um, I, I think I had mentioned we're hoping to improve the quality of the data we collect now. So the race, ethnicity, and language data, and then also incorporate the sexual orientation and gender identity data um, by communicating with our um, register registration um, staff, any staff that works um, to input that data, um, to just understand that, or make sure that they understand why we're, the, we're collecting it, the data and to help give them maybe some scripting around um, how to um, help patients understand why we collect the data. Um, and then to, we have a community health needs assessment um, integrating the information that we collect from that process from community, um, but also um, looking at how we integrate uh, patients and community into the actual projects. So for example, we've identified colorectal cancer screening um, for our African American patient population as an opportunity. We want to ensure that there are patient and community voices throughout that process. Um, so first, you know, we'll, we'll say sort of, you know, internally we've seen this disparity. Is this um, something that community also sees as an opportunity to work with us on? And then if so, how do we move forward together um, from a sort of patient um, engagement and education perspective? But I think regardless, there is work that we can do internally to ensure that you know, the providers um, are, understand the different ways, um, different uh, modalities for um, screening, colorectal cancer screening, um, and understanding, making sure that we have the proper workflows in place to, to trigger when to offer different um, options. So um, I think there's, you know, there's, there's opportunity to increase um, understanding of what the disparities are and the root cause and just ensuring that we're using the different tools that we have at our disposal. Perfect. Okay. Phil asks, you mentioned that putting an infrastructure into place to pull the data and then base decisions on the data is the hard part. But I'm curious if you can offer a bit of detail on the infrastructure you put into place. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple things. Um, there's the, so right now, our one health equity goal um, lives on our system scorecard, which is great. Um, but there are many other metrics that we should be collecting from a health equity and from an overall diversity, equity, inclusion perspective. And so um, working to build that separate scorecard 
um, to ensure that our system, our teams can see what we're doing um, around health, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So from a health equity perspective, what are the disparities we're looking at? Um, what are, um, how are we, how many of our colleagues are actually um, collecting this data? So in 2021, we'll be focusing on sort of normalizing the importance of collecting the data and putting out a survey to say, who's, you know, who's actually using these filters now? And as the tools roll out, we'll be monitoring um, how often people are using the, the filters in their, their dashboards. Um, and then also from an infrastructure perspective, looking at um, you know, how are we building equity into the patient care policies that we have in place. Um, and so uh, next year, we'll be looking at how many of our patient care po policies we actually um, look at from a health equity perspective. So building out a toolkit or a guide to kind of help folks uh, review their policies from a health equity perspective, or you know, if they're building, um, creating new policies, um, have that lens as they are um, um, developing. So it's it's looking at you know, or anticipating um, any unintended cause um, um, issues um, that may disproportionately affect um, our equity populations. Um, also ensuring that um, the language is as inclusive as possible. Um, and so, you know, for us, yes, we, we, have, we have our one disparity that we've, we focus on, but there's so many, there's so much opportunity for us to expand on, on, on that. And um, I think a lot of it, the next year will be normalizing and increasing awareness um, of the tools that we have. Um, and then also um, some of the, the education that's needed. Perfect, okay. Um, Amber asks, do you recommend working with an external facilitator or trainer to ensure objectivity and reduce likelihood of awkwardness among staff in case of a small organization? Hmm. I, I'm kind of <laughs> battling with that. On the one hand, I can understand. Um, so, so for us, like, so we have our bias training, but then we're also implementing something called the IDI, and now I'm forgetting what it stands for. But the IDI is essentially a tool to help folks understand um, sort of where they're at on, um, in terms of acceptance of um, how differences um, actually. Um, contribute to our organization. So, um, you know, using, implementing like an IDI tool um, to sort of uh, increase awareness and give people a plan to actually do some of that self work around bias, um, I think can be done by an external facilitator because when it gets personal like that, that is, it's awkward. Um, but I think that the goal should be to work towards being able to have those conversations internally because a lot of this is culture shift, right? And so if you can't have vulnerable conversations with your colleagues internally, I don't I, I think it's difficult for you to be able to actually make the change needed. So if you're in a healthcare, if you're a healthcare provider, make the change needed to um, in your culture to be able to improve upon patient care and eliminate those disparities. So, because you have to get to a point where you have to support each other in actually implementing some of those mitigation strategies. Um, and as uncomfortable as it sounds, getting to a point where we can call each other out <laughs> in a respectful way um, and, and work through some of the awkwardness together. Yeah, thank you. Okay, next question. Um, let's see, Jessica asks, how will or has your team addressed health equity and how community public safety trauma impacts one's physical and mental health? Yeah, so um, for those of you that are not in Minnesota or local, um, our um, one of our hospitals is right in the community where George Floyd um, was killed, was murdered. And, um, 
you know, as we have, you know, reimagined or restated, <laughs> recommitted to our community, um, we are committed to supporting the recovery of the Phillips neighborhood. Um, and part of that is addressing um, the safety concerns. And so, um, you know, we're in the, the midst of just understanding what, what the needs are of the community um, and understanding how we can support those safety concerns. And I think our learnings from that will inform how we support other communities um, because you know we're a large healthcare system the communities we support look very different you know we have urban um environments and then we also have rural and so but i think that just incorporating that mindset to say although we are a healthcare system there is opportunity for us to impact the different parts of uh, what influences health um, and I think we can, we can learn from, we can, we can apply that to any, any, um, environment. Great. Thank you. Um, Nadia asks, since starting to do health equity work, have you noticed any internal changes with regards to who's hired, who's promoted in positions of leadership within your organization? Um, I have not noticed any specific Hires, but I have noticed um, intentional um, efforts to ensure that there are diverse candidates coming to the table and, and being considered. Um, so I, I do think that internally, yes, there's an increased level of awareness um, and different groups are working on, you know, how to remove bias from the interview process. And um, so I think, um, with all this, it takes time, right? Um, but but I think most importantly, yes, we are seeing increased awareness and action um, towards um, increasing diversity in our um, hires. Perfect. Looks like Nadia had one other question. How did you train staff to ask about real demographic data? Um, I, so I think the initial rollout of that happened before I came into this role. And so um, what I will be doing next year is understanding sort of what folks know um, and what what else they need to be able to ask that in, that question or those ask for that information. So hopefully I can share that next some other time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, Hope asks, do you think companies could benefit from having the implicit bias course as part of the list of corporate compliance competencies for employees annually, rather than offering the course as an elective? Um, so for us, the foundation, foundational bias training will be mandatory. It's re you know, replacing one of the trainings we've had to date. Um, so I do think that there's a level of Yes, you should have like the foundational training mandatory just to at least start to build some of that awareness awareness for folks that maybe not aren't um, as convinced. <laughs> um, but I, I don't think it ends with just training. I think you have to integrate, um, you know, conversations and, and spaces for folks to be vulnerable and talk about their own explore their own journey, um, talk about their experiences, ask questions uh, with their colleagues. Um, so I think it's a, I think it's a both and um, because training only does so much, you have to then start to think about how do we actually incorporate it into our, our operations. So for example, um, you know, I'm really interested in seeing how do we incorporate um, this concept of bias into our um, or at least awareness of bias um, into our our huddle process, um, and um, also looking at um, patient or visitor um, concerns or issues. You know, looking at doing a, a root cause analysis to say, you know, did bias actually could bias have entered into um, this situation and how the outcome. Um, or influence the outcome. So, you know, I think beyond training, there's opportunity to go the next 
level to say, how do we actually increase um, or integrate the concept into um, the way we do our work? Perfect. Okay, we are at the top of the hour. I'm gonna see if we can get in uh, one or two more questions and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, okay, S Samar asks, thank you for the presentation. One of my questions is whether you have before or now work with any urban city planners in health equity work. Plus was wondering what type of work people in urban planning professions can do in a, uh, with an organization like yours. Um, so no, we have not, that, to my knowledge, done any of that work. And I would love to explore that with you. Um, I'm always curious to see how um, we can collaborate with others. It's, it's crucial. So feel free to send me an email. We can talk. Perfect. Okay, let's do one more question. Um, maybe two more if we can get them in. Okay, um, Jessica asks, um, what has been the biggest challenge or mistakes your team has learned from mistakes with such diverse populations in such a challenging time in our country? Mm. Um, I think I would just highlight the opportunity, I keep saying this, but the opportunity to authentically engage patients and community in the solutions. So co-creating the solutions together. I think that in the past, um, we've done a lot of sort of, okay, we have this issue, let's go ask them about it. And then we go back internally and, and fix it. Um, um, I think there's an opportunity to say, hey, there's this issue that either community patients have, have lifted up or we've seen internally, let's talk about the issue. Let's co-create the solution together. I think that that is one of the learnings that we have. Um, and it'll, it'll take time for our, our teams to get comfortable doing that in terms of just working uh, outside of ourselves. But I think it's, it's, cru it's crucial for us to see lasting change. Perfect. Okay, I think I'm going to make this our last question. Um, if you do have more questions, Vivian's email is up on the screen. You can go ahead and email her and with your questions, but we'll try and just do one more live. Um, so Charles asks, how are you measuring the impact of the implicit bias training? Yeah, so um, I think beyond, uh, well, the, let me see if I can go back. So we, we have, a, have this measure on our scorecard. So we are looking to see sort of, if the referral rates are improving. Um, but I think going forward, um, we'll continue to monitor changes, but we will also be in a better position to sort of respond to any, um, you know, so as we look monthly to see if, you know, if there's, if we're not meeting goal uh, a couple months in a row, how we wanna be able to pivot quickly and address the the issue and say you know what else what else what changes do we need to make in um our uh, implementation um so be able to be agile and and respond to uh, unfavorable outcomes 